uh, welcome to our new Flourish webinars. Some of you might be aware that um, back a couple of months ago, uh, we kind of uh, stopped our previous tea break webinars, uh, which were our kind of um, bite-sized uh, sessions about Flourish, and we were covering quite a few uh, Flourish-specific topics. Um, however, uh, we had a little bit of a summer break, and um, the Flourish content team uh, decided that maybe it's a good idea for us to um, take our webinars um, a little bit further and uh, on an upper level, so we can actually start uh, exploring uh, best uh, data visualization practices, more topic-driven uh, data visualization stories, and things like that. Um, so we are super excited uh, to welcome you all here. Uh, this is our very first uh, rebranded Flourish webinar, which is going to be a little bit different. Um, so this one is going to be one hour long and um, every single webinar from now on is going to be one hour as well. Um, and uh, we decided to um, kick off this uh, session with five data visualization mistakes uh, a lot of us um, are making or were making in the past and how to fix them. Uh, my name is Simona. Uh, I have Mafe here with me today. Um, we work um, in the content team here at Flourish and we are super, super excited to be here. Thank you, Simona. Um, yeah, hello everybody. My name is Mafe. I'm part of the content team here at Flourish and I'm going to be your host for today's session. Um, this is the agenda. I'm going to be going over um, five common data visualization mistakes, how to fix them, hopefully. And I'm also going to be sharing some help docs and resources on how to improve your chart making practice. So um, just a quick um, well, message is that Simone and I are in the same room. So if you do hear any echo or any like sort of situation, it's because we are in a different setup than what we're used to. So do bear with us. And as she said, we're very excited and slightly nervous um, to host this webinar. So yeah, but it's good nerves. So let's just get started. So um, to kick off the session, I just want to preface by saying that data visualization is a very dynamic field. It's always changing. Things change. That means that practice that we thought are good may not be so good anymore, or things we wouldn't even envision of doing before now are possible, and maybe we should be encouraged to take them on as well. So all the mistakes that I'm going to be sharing today um, may or may not be super relevant to you and your chart, practicing, um, chart practice, but it's just a good idea to you know keep those muscles working and keep your mind sharp and just to revise your practice and see what you're doing and what can you improve. And that is the goal for this webinar. So without further ado, let's just get started with the first mistake, which is to put form over function. And I want to start with this quote from um, Alberto Caro, a really wonderful um, data visualization expert and chart maker. And he said on his book, The Functional Art, which I highly recommend, the first goal of an infographic is not to be beautiful just for the sake of eye appeal, but above all, to be understandable first and beautiful after that or to be beautiful thanks to its exquisite functionality. And the mistake of putting form over function is that we put aesthetics before functionality or actual purpose. So we need to remind ourselves that charts are tools. Charts help us communicate with our users, our readers, um, our viewers. They help us um, tell a message, show data in different ways, or simply explain something to someone. So we really need to keep in mind what is the objective of our, of our chart? What are we trying to tell, to explain with that before we add any artifact, any ornament, or just take any other decisions, make any other decisions. So for that to be possible, we really need to be sharp and know how to select the correct chart type for our data. And with that in mind, I want to start the session with a quick example. Please comment in the chat, how do you think we should visualize this data? Quick overview, this is monthly percent change in UK house prices from April um, 2021 until April 2022. Um, Simona, if you can take a look at the chat and just let me know, we can you know, give people a couple of seconds to suggest potential chart options. Okay, so we have, huh, interesting. <laughs> so we have two times a bar chart, one time uh, a line chart, and uh, a calendar with the percentage. So almost like a heat map. Okay, interesting. Um, cool. 
yeah, sorry, as I said, we are in the same room, so a bit of echo there. Um, grand, well, thank you everybody who participated there. So I was expecting people to suggest the line chart, and that is the natural um, first thought that people would have if they've done charts before, because we are taught in theory that time series should always be represented with, with lines. That is just what theory says. Um, and it makes perfect sense, right? We're talking about um, consecutive data through a year in this case, April 2021, April 2022. However, we can see in this chart that a line chart might not be the best um, alternative in this case. And we can see why. We have a considerable drop from uh, May 2021 until June 2021, and we go into negative numbers, and line charts are not great, are separating positives from negatives. In this particular case, we're not able to color this differently. For instance, I had to add an axis highlight here to make sure that the 0% was visible so people would understand that this is going into the negative numbers. And overall, this is just not such a clear chart to showcase um, what we were trying to show, which is the cumulative, um, or rather the evolution in house prices in the UK. So maybe a different alternative would be a normal column chart, right? This looks much better. Um, the height of the columns matches the um, percent increase or decrease. We can see much clearer that during June, prices actually decrease the only time um, throughout this year. And overall, even though this is um, an improvement from the line chart, it's not quite where we want it to be because as I mentioned before, the objective, the objective here is to show the cumulative increase and how prices have evolved over time. Um, so the right, oh well, the right, the best option in this case would be to build a waterfall chart. And waterfalls are um, different from bar charts in that the baseline for the next bar or for each bar continuous bar would be the highest point of the previous bar. So here, not only can we see the absolute percent change by month, but we can also see the decrease in June by the change of color, but also direction. This bar, even though it's um, not super enhanced, it's going down. It's not growing as the other ones are. And we can overall see how the price increased throughout um, the time series that we saw which was not really possible to detect with the other two chart types. So here we can see how I knew very clearly what I wanted to do, what I wanted to show, the message I was trying to convey, and I just experimented with different chart types until I reached the best selection. However, I am aware that it's not super simple to always choose which chart type to um, match your data with. And so here are a couple of resources or tools that you can use in your chart making practice. First, we have um, the Financial Times Visual Vocabulary. This is a really, really useful resource if you haven't come across it before. It's basically a guide that divides chart types by functions. So for instance, you have correlation or you have geographical data, um, part of a whole time series, et cetera. And then you have little classifications and examples of the charts you can make with it. Um, there is an online version and also I think a poster um, if you want the static version. And it's overall a really, really good resource um, that you can use or that you should use if you're especially getting started and just want to see what other chart types are there and how to use them. And on top of that, um, here at Flourish, we do have our very own template chooser. This is what you find whenever you're going to create a new chart in Flourish. This is within the app, and it's populated with dozens of pre-populated templates to choose from. Each of our templates comes with sample data, meaning that when you create a new chart, you will see the data structure that matches that chart type, but also the type of data that is good for that particular chart. And that can help you um, choose charts in the future. You can see how these are clustered. So for instance, we have or the line bar pie, so line charts, column charts, bar charts, pie charts, et cetera, maps, scatter, um, geographical data, hierarchy, and so on and so forth. And this setup should help you and will help you select the best chart for your data. So a few takeaways from this first mistake is that charts need to have a clear purpose or a use. Um, you need to choose the charts that are fit for purpose and that your chart type should not be selected just because it looks cool or it's aesthetic. You really need to keep in mind that your charts are tools and they need to um, fulfill a specific purpose. So now let's move to mistake number two, which is using axes wrong. Uh, specifically, it's the non-zero baseline. So this might be the most controversial mistake I'm going to be talking about today. And the controversy lies in that some people say that non-zero baselines are forbidden, they shouldn't happen, there's no um, exception or no situation in which they're allowed. 
other people may believe that they're absolutely fine. You can use them whenever you want. And we lie in the middle saying that it's okay to use them sometimes depending on your data or depending on what you're trying to show. And I'm going to be explaining why in just a second. So when not to use them. You should not use a non-zero baseline chart when this is going to skew the data or where it's going to interfere with the elements that are encoding the data. And this is specifically true for bar charts or column charts. Bar charts and column charts encode the data by the length or the width of the bar or the column. And humans naturally tend to believe that these things grow from zero, that they start from natural um, point, which would be a baseline. So in this case, for instance, um, we can see in this bar chart, first we can see that the axis is on the um, right side, which is not usual. Usually axes are on the left side. So that would be a first comment, but it's not super relevant to the baseline. But then we can see that the baseline starts at 34% in this case, not at zero. And so this part representing 35% actually looks much shorter than the 39.6% bar. Um, Basically here, what we are doing or what this chart is doing, it's manipulating its data. It's creating a bigger separation between bar one and bar two, where really there isn't that much of a distance. And if we plot that against a normal bar chart starting from zero, we can see that the difference is really not that drastic and that this definitely it's not um, good chart making practice. And I jokingly say that basically starting your bar chart or column chart um, on something that is not zero. It's like telling your height from the knee up. Um, you're not giving people enough context and you are being misleading and people are not going to be able to understand the data correctly. However, there are chances or situations in which you are fine to actually use a non-zero baseline chart. And for instance, that could be, or that can happen with line charts. First, because um, the values are not encoded through the length of the element, line charts, as we saw in the first like example, basically showcase the data by the position of the dots on an axis. And yes, axis is important because that determines how high the point is on the canvas. But the main point here is just the correlation be or the relationship between one point and the next one and how they relate and form the actual lines. So you can see the pattern. In this case, we can see this wavy pattern. Here we're showcasing Apple um, stock prices in the UK from January up until September. And in this case, I can tell that the zero axis is actually not that useful. We can tell that all my data is quite far from zero. Um, luckily for Apple, stocks prices are quite high. So all of this information is actually quite redundant. There's no data point that's that below in my axis. So all of this is extra space in my canvas that is not helping me convey any information. So by truncating the axis or cropping the axis, I actually get a much better overview of my data. I'm able to see each data point, each increase and each decrease much better, much sharply. And I can definitely tell um, the shape much better. I can see the decrease around June, a little bump in here, and then another sharp decrease by mid-June, starting of July, and then the steady increase that stock prices saw during the summer months. And now in September, how they are decreasing again. And just for emphasis here, I'm just going to go back into the zero baseline example, how this is really not that well conveyed versus this one right here. So this point would be the data calls for it, meaning that you can definitely know by looking at your data, by understanding your data, when your chart um, would benefit from not having a zero baseline. Now let's go through another example together. This is from our blog, which was posted yesterday. Um, in the blog, we go over four data visualization mistakes and how to fix them. So as you can see, we've inspired this session in that content of that blog. So here we're showing the results of the women's 100 meter breaststroke um, exercise in the Rio 2016 Paralympics. And we are showcasing um, the time of the, this series. And of course, the shorter the bar, the quicker the swimmer. So in this case, I'm starting my bars at 100 seconds and the fastest swimmer um, completed the race at 101.63 seconds, whereas the slowest completed it at 112 seconds and 33. Um, however, even though the difference is of only 10 seconds, this bar is actually eight times longer than this bar. And if, again, I repeat the data, 101 versus 112, we know that there's no way that um, it's eight times faster, we, but that is visually what this chart is conveying. 
And people may choose to use this chart because they're trying to showcase the difference between the different swimmers. They don't care about the rest, but this is misleading. So yeah, we can see the highlighting here of like the fastest and the slowest. But my proposal in this example would be to actually showcase the full length of the bars, um, the full times. And here you can see that the difference between the swimmers is not that much. I mean, 10 seconds is really not that much anyway. But if you're really keen on highlighting the differences between winners and losers, then what you can do is simply use a stacked bar chart in this case, highlighting um, anything that's over time from the winner's time. So the winner's time would be your base time and anything that's above it would be highlighted. And here you can definitely tell um, the difference between the different athletes. Another alternative in this case, as I said, is that bars and columns convey data through the length of the bars and the columns. Um, whereas other chart types do it by position, such as the case of the scatter plots. So in this case, my scatter plot starting from a hunt from zero, sorry, in this case from a zero baseline, shows the different times of my swimmers. And if I go into my next step, I can see the difference between each swimmer by truncating the axis. And again, I can benefit from just using the position. It's not as harsh as looking at the bar and truncating the bar. Um, here, I don't get the impression that this point is eight times um, further removed to the right than this point, which is what was happening with the bars that was causing like this visual um, disjoint almost. And I can also benefit from the animation of moving my dots from the um, absolute position of the total time to this relative position or just of just the difference. Now, the key takeaways of this second uh, mistake is that zero baseline charts are okay to use if they don't skew the data. It is generally good to include the zero. As I said, human beings visually and just like logically instinctively, we look for a natural zero, we look for a normal beginning. And if you can, if you're able, if your data allows it, it's good to include the zero. And if you're just getting started with charts, if you are wondering whether you should use or not a zero baseline, then chances are you might not need it. So it might be best to skip them and err on the safe side. I'm going to ask Simona if there are any um, underlying questions in the chat, just to make sure. Okay, she's saying no, so I'll just, I shall carry on with mistake number three, um, which is not providing enough context in our charts. And the lack of context in charts can happen either because there is not enough data in the chart, meaning we're focusing on a very small subsection of our data set, or because we're cherry picking data, which is a big no-no in data visualization and statistics in general, or because there's not enough text, which may sound counterintuitive because charts are very much visual. They are, um, yeah, I mean, they're not bound to have text. You precisely, you're asked to do charts to not use many words, right? However, not having enough labels or not having a descriptive title or not having annotations to explain the data and help the user might cause it to not have enough context and therefore um, your viewers or readers may not understand what you're trying to convey. So let's take a look at this example. Here I have a fair enough descriptive title which is median temperature anomaly in the last decade and I'm showing average temperature anomaly in Celsius from 2011 until 2019. So Overall, this looks like a nice chart. It's a line chart. It's the correct chart type. This I'm showing a time series. I have all my data points labeled correctly, so I know exactly what I'm looking at. However, because we already know what the topic is, median temperature anomaly, we know that temperatures have been increasing. This is a fact. We also know that this phenomena are much on, are better understood when looking at historical data, when looking at much further data, data from further back, rather and that this is simply not the full story. So here the mistake is that we don't have enough data. Now, if we take a look at historical records from the 1800s up until um, 2019, we can see a different story, right? We can see how temperatures have been steadily increasing um, over time, but especially in the last um, 40 to 50 years, like you can see this sharp increase in here. And if I go back into my first um, chart, it almost looks like a flat line. It almost, you almost get the impression that the issue is not even that severe or that maybe temperatures are not rising that fast. But when I look at the full extent of the data, it's much clearer that it's a different story. Now, 
what can make this chart even better is to add annotations. And here we did it through um, Flourish Axis Highlights. I've highlighted the last decade, which is that first, again, I'm going to go to my first chart. This bit right here has been highlighted, put into context in the historical data. And then I've also added a second highlight to just high, um, um, yes, bring forward the information from 1970s where the sharpest increase has been noticed. And overall, this is a much better chart than the first one, providing context through both text elements, my axis highlights, and the extra amount of data from the historical records. So a few takeaways here are that we need to select all the relevant data to tell our story. We need to add the necessary text to complement charts, but don't fall into extremes. Um, don't cherry pick, but also don't choose too much data. Also, don't put a lot of text in your charts. If you find yourself adding labels on labels on labels, then maybe think whether you have the right chart type or even whether your data should be shown in a chart. Not everything should be um, a chart. Maybe a table is good enough. Maybe you just need like a richer paragraph, but just keep this in mind um, and evaluate and assess correctly. Now we're going on to mistake number four, which is lack of a clear narrative. And this is something that we see a lot um, through customers or through other chart um, makers, which is what am I trying to tell really affects the decisions that I need to make in my chart making journey or in my chart making process for a specific project for a specific story. So first things first is that we're all storytellers. And if this sounds too media to you, if this sounds something like belongs to a newspaper or like just the media industry, I just would like to point out that if you're trying to communicate something, you're trying to tell a story, you need to have a clear thread, a clear arc um, that ties your message, your charts together, and even the charts within your, um, for instance, your report, your presentation, whatever you're trying to show, everything needs to be tied up together. Everything needs to have a cohesive arc um, that keeps it together. And so you are telling a story and this is relevant to you as well. So some things that may help you tell your story better or understand your story better is to split your charts. Um, oftentimes we're trying to showcase very, very complex data in just one chart and that can overwhelm the reader or the user. So sometimes more is better. You need to split your charts, maybe create several versions of it um, with different iterations, with different annotations, with different colors. And in this case, we are benefiting from Flourish Stories to create a sort of slideshow to go deeper into our chart. So this is actually from a blog from, I believe, last summer about the IPCC report. Um, so all this data belongs to them, and you can find this example in our blog. But first of all, we have this example of historical reconstructed temperatures from um, 5 AD up until 2020. And the overall story that we're trying to tell here is how temperatures have changed and risen over the years. So first, we're given the reader context by providing historical records. We're adding a little highlight in here to showcase the observed temperatures, temperatures of which we have actual um, scientific records. Then we're zooming in to that little snippet of time, which is between the 1850s and 2020, to observe that rise in temperatures. And in this particular case, we want to tell this story of how different factors have influenced the rise of temperatures. Here, through color, through annotations, and through an extra series in the chart, we're showing how if we only took into consideration natural factors, temperatures wouldn't have risen practically at all in the past um, 200 years or so. But if we take into consideration human and natural factors, we can almost map out the current observations, meaning that humans have had an impact in the rise of temperatures. And that is the story that we were trying to tell. And we were able to effectively do so by splitting our charts. Imagine if this original or initial chart had all of that information all of those scholars, all of those annotations, all of those um, labels, it would have been too much and we wouldn't have been able to comprehend the final message. So again, splitting your charts can really be an effective way of telling your story to your readers, to your users much better. Now, really tied up to that idea, it's that we can rely on and animations to tie our charts together. And Flourish is partic particularly good at doing this. We have an amazing animations module and developers that are working on this around the clock to make sure that they're even better. And through stories and through different um, chart options within the tool, you are able to have nice effects like this one. Again, you're zooming into the, the chart by not only tying two 
different charts together, but also by joining them in a single story and using the animation here to move from one to the other. And this is a very effective mechanism to connect with your readers, but also to make sure that they connect with the data you are showing them. And in that case, we were using external elements such as the stories or just just tying it up. But some of our templates include animations within their own construction, within their own um, strong points. And this is an example on the Data Explorer um, on which we also have a blog about it, which you can read more in our blog. And basically the chart, um, the, sorry, the Data Explorer has the huge advantage that it morphs elements into different chart, um, chart types, but also elements within different charts. So, can see how the bubbles in here can morph into different groups, but at the same time, the bubbles can merge into maps and maps can either be regions or can be tiled maps. So all of these iterations help convey more data, more information and help you tell your story much better. Now, moving on to other things you can do to improve your storytelling within charts is to work with color. Um, and in this case, I'm going to talk about the color overrides. So color overrides in Flourish allow you to basically um, ignore or go above the palette you might have in your chart and to highlight specific elements, add accents to some or mute others that you don't want to bring the attention to as much. So here my data is CO2 emissions per capita in Europe. And this is what I get when I input my data raw into Flourish. This chart has no... Um, it has nothing done to it. This is literally me putting in the data and just seeing a bit of a spaghetti mess with all these colors and everything just mushed in together. I cannot understand anything. And this is a too long, uh, like, um, oh gosh, a legend to actually understand what's going on here. So the first thing we can do is we can grade it all out. And I'm a huge fan of this technique, which is everything goes to gray except the element that I want to highlight. In this case, the United Kingdom, I highlighted the country's line and just make sure that it's a bright color, in this case red, to see its trajectory over time in context with all the other European nations. Now I can take this further if I want to highlight multiple countries, in this case, United Kingdom, Germany, and Russia. And again, everything else is grayed out. Now, how did I do this? This is a quick recap on how to do color overrides. First things first is that I bound the lines for the series that I wanted to show first first on my data and my data bindings. Um, this might mean that you cannot bind the full, the full range um, as quickly as you would if you just left it to be in the normal order. It takes a little bit of work to just calculate you know, the alphabet and know when to put the, the different commas and split, but it is well worth it. And these labels are plotted on top. Then I edited my color palette and I make the gray. So all the other lines would be grayed out. And I added my overrides here in the section that says custom overrides in the settings. And I added the swatches, the different hues that I wanted my lines to be colored by. And last but not least, I deleted the big legend that I had at the very beginning and simply included the three countries that I wanted to highlight. We have plenty of documentation and help docs on this. These are all linked at the end of the, um, the presentation, so no worries. You will, be, you will be able to go over the steps on how to recreate this if you're interested. Now, we can take this even further by working with color transparency. Even though this is a much better chart than the first example that I show you with all of those colors, um, I find it very annoying that all of these labels, or, sorry, these lines are the same opacity. They're very dense. It's a very dense gray. So we might feel tempted to add a little bit of opacity to them if the chart wants to load. Here we go. So in this example, I just set every line in the chart to be 50% opaque. And this is something you can do through the line chart um, template, sorry, the line bar pie template. Um, but the problem here is that everything is set to be the same opacity and even my highlighted regions are just diluted. They are not popping into my chart anymore. So here's with this little hack of color overrides and transparency comes in. So what I just did is I added a alpha value to my gray color and made it 50% opacity while keeping my highlighted lines 100% opacity. And even though it's a very, very subtle change, you can see how these lines are popping from all the gray mess right here. And it's quickly to follow. It's much better for the eye and it's clear overall to the story I'm trying to tell. So jumping back into my slides right here. Okay, here we go. Now, 
how can you make um, or how can you use the color transparency hack in Flourish is you would do exactly the same as you were doing with the color overrides, but you would simply add the alpha value to your base color, in this case, the gray, which it, it would be a two digit um, number that you would add here. And that would apply the um, opacity percentage that you're setting to your chart. Um, I've linked in this slide um, the sheet sheet that I use to basically know what two-digit number I need to add to my colors because I don't know them by heart. I believe 30, for instance, could be 30%, but it could also be 50% because there are real alphanumeric combinations. So don't ask me to explain them because I really don't know um, how they're constructed. But the point is that these will make these lines 30% opaque, while this one will stay 100%. And a huge advantage is that alpha colors stack, meaning that if you add multiple transparencies, they will multiply the transparency and you can get really cool um, versions of charts and just like really nice overlays as well. So a uh, few, few uh, key takeaways from this fourth mistake is that have, having a clear narrative arc before starting to blue your charts, it's really important. Knowing what you're trying to show and how you want to show it um, is really the first step to building your charts. Then um, you should make the most out of the tools that you have to tell your story. In this case, I show you a couple of hacks and tricks that you can do with Flourish and just understanding your tools and knowing how you can make the most of them will really enhance your chart making skills as well. Um, last but not least, don't make decisions based on whether they just look good. This is back to the form over function mistake. Always keep in mind what you're trying to tell, why you're trying to tell it and what, what is your purpose whenever making these decisions. And we're almost at the end. This is mistake number five, and it's chart junk. So what is chart junk, you may be asking yourselves. Well, it is basically clutter. Sorry to spoil it. Um, but chart junk is a term that was um, coined by um, Edward Tofty. He is a statistician and data visualization just expert and yeah, one of the main authors on the field. And he explained that chart junk is just conventional graphical paraphernalia. And he also said that the interior decoration of charts generates a lot of ink that does not tell the viewer anything new. Regardless of its cost, it is all non-data ink or redundant data ink. And this is from his book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, also known as The Bible of Data Visualization. Um, another really good read. Um, if you are interested in diving deeper into your chart making. But he's mentioned non-data ink and data ink. So what is that? And we have the data ink ratio. So data ink, it's the non-erasable core of a graphic and the data ink ratio, it's basically the proportion of data ink. So the resources, what you're using to physically make your charts and the total ink used in the whole of the chart. So keep in mind that he wrote this before charts were made in computers or they were as um, widely spread as they are today in software tools and online tools like Flourish or other existing tools. Um, so the whole purpose of the data to ink ratio was just to use your resources wisely and to make sure that the ink you were using to build your chart really was equating to the value that it was adding to your chart. Um, and that really makes sense. I know now we're dealing with pixels. We really don't have to worry or be concerned about how much ink we're printing into a page, but the principle holds, which is to use as much elements as value they add to the chart meaning we don't need to add a lot of things to our charts for them to be okay, for them to be correct, and for them to actually be legible. So here we have a side-by-side -side comparison of what a data to ink ratio chart would look like and what chart junk would look like. Um, this is actually a recreation of one of Tufti's uh, charts from the book. Um, same with the data, like I just literally copied it and made it in Flourish. And we can see a couple of the things that make this chart much elegant and efficient, we can say ink efficient, even though, again, we are not using any ink here, is that we are redundant, um, sorry, removing redundant elements like the axes or even the dots at the end of the lines in our slope chart. We, yes, we don't have any ornaments like those little, um, as I said, circles at the end of the lines. We also don't have different colors in this case because we have a very um, small series of data entries. We have like, what, less than 15, less than 12, and it's pretty easy to follow. We really don't need to add artifice for us to understand the charts. And the main value, it's conveyed through the steepness and whether the slopes are going up or down. So it's a pretty legible chart with minimal elements. 
On the contrary, we have the chart junk example, and we have a lot of things that could be easily removed, like redundant elements with the legend. We clearly have our series labeled here, and the colors are all distinctive, so the legend, it's not necessary. The dots are not adding any sort of value to the chart, and maybe for a, stylist, uh, for a stylistic or aesthetic option or decision, you might want to leave them, but they're really not adding any uh, value to it. Um, we have lines connecting the value to the dots. Again, that it's not adding anything at all. We have axes, which arguably would be could be removable. Um, in this case, we can see that it's not affecting the experience that we have from the chart. So arguably, yes, they could be removed. And we also have a background that is not doing us any favor as well. So ornamental elements, redundant elements, and yeah, just decisions that are little to no value. That all contributes to chart junk. Now, for an example, uh, this is a fun one. Let us improve this chart. Um, yeah, I really had to go against all the rules in the book to build this. So let's unbuild it and just make sure that we can fix this, shall we? A couple of things that are really not good with this chart is, of course, the background. I cannot stress this enough. There are really, 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 really few instances in which a background may help your chart. Actually, if you have good examples, I'd be super interested to, to see them or hear them. So feel free to, if you have them at hand, put them in the chat or send us a message on social media. Like, I'm really, you know, I've searched high and low for good examples of charts with backgrounds, guys. Um, but here it's just adding clutter. It really has, it's not adding any information to the chart and it's just very distracting. On top of that, we have the grid right here, which is just very clutter. And even though some people may choose to keep both the X axis and the Y axis grid lines, um, in this case, I think they're just a bit too much. We also have data labels for each data point and it's a very long time series. So this is definitely overkill. We have a redundant, um, legend here because we only have one series so we definitely don't need to know that this color belongs to this line um, and we have a very descriptive title so again this is all very 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 redundant so how can we fix it well first things first we remove that hideous background thank you very much and i'm keeping the dark theme um, for this example because that is really not something that we see often so i wanted to experiment with that but this is already much much better and clearer now next things I removed the grid lines for the X axis because they were not adding that much value. And I removed a, a couple of um, elements from my X axis as well, because as I mentioned, it's a very long time series. So I really don't need to go one by one, just keeping a few, it's more than enough. And set them to be 90 degrees rather than 45. This was more of a personal decision rather than actually a good practice, but I generally don't like angled axes. So I just made that executive call myself and I made these lines also way thinner because if you notice on the first example they were quite thick and again that is not adding any value to the chart then I actually swapped the dark um, the black background by a darker gray this is much nicer to the eye we can see how this is very 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 harsh versus this being a bit more mild to the eye and made sure that my line was in a very high contrasting color like this yellow that works really nice with the gray as in comparison to this darker purple I also removed the data labels for each of the points and the hollowed circles that I had on the original chart, which were not adding any value. And because I have so many points, it was really, really too much. I deleted the legend as well. And the last thing that I did, or a couple of last things I did, um, we have a setting in Flourish, which allows you to match the color of your series to a header element that matches the series name on the data. So in this case, consumer price index, which is the line that I'm showing right here, it's colored the same as my line. And that creates a visual relationship between the chart and the text elements for my readers so they understand what the chart is about. Um, I also added an axis highlight to mark, to mark the zero because I don't know if you could notice in previous versions, but this chart goes into negative values. And this helps the reader understand that and be aware of it. And I also increase the y axis by one point. So before my minimum axis was minus one. And here I set it to be minus two, just to give it a little bit of extra room in here. And we can definitely see how this doesn't skew the data because people may argue that that's manipulating the data, setting a new, like larger axis. But um, 
maybe it's open for debate. I think it actually works quite well and it doesn't affect the chart um, at all. So the few takeaways from this last mistake chart junk are that you need to keep your ornamental elements to the minimum or avoid them altogether. You could add extra elements once the chart fulfills its function. It's a really good practice to first build the chart that really um, fits its fit for purpose, that answers the question you're trying to answer. And then you can start adding other elements So make sure you have um, the, ba the basics first, and then you can add other elements. And last but not least is that your aesthetics cannot get in the way of good chart making practices. This is really important and I cannot stress it enough. It's not about things looking pretty, it's about things being functional and being truthful. So with that, uh, we mark the end of the theoretical element of the webinar. And now I have some resources to share with you that you can check at your own time and in your own pace. We have some blogs about um, this very topic. I mean, just yesterday we published for common data visualization mistakes and how to fix them. I cover two of the mistakes um, in that blog in this webinar. Um, the other two are brand new, so you can take a look at that. We also have a guide to creating compelling visualizations and three ways to make your chart more accessible. I thought this were the most relevant um, the blogs like to match with this topic and then as for the help docs i'm just um, gathering a good collection here to get you started choosing the right chart for your data choosing the right map for your data um, sources to get you started how to do color overrides as i covered here how to do transparency as i um, also mentioned in here and how to add axis highlights and last but certainly not least, um, do reach out to us. If you have any comments or feedback or questions about the webinars, you can um, email us at flourishwebinar.canva.com. If you have any questions about support or any technical issues, um, the support team is there to help you. Um, and then we also have the hello at flourish.studio email, which is just for like general inquiries or um, main point of contact. And with that, I just have to thank you for joining me here today. And now I believe we do have some time. So I guess we open the floor to any questions and over to Simona. That was great. Thank you, Mafe. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Um, I hope um, you uh, had a blast. We did. <laughs> um, and um, as we have a little bit more time, we thought it might be a good idea uh, for um, Flor new Flourish users and uh, people who might not be um, uh, that aware of any new changes and uh, things happening in Flourish uh, to just give you a very quick overview of um, um, all the latest uh, things that we thought are worth mentioning. So a very exciting change uh, that so many people were so happy about is that our 3D map template uh, now has a line layer. Um, that means that you can visualize um, anything from um, the last marathon or uh, tube lines, subway lines, um, anything like that. Um, and uh, it's very fun and very easy to use. Um, and what are you actually seeing right now on uh, the screen is not the screen recording or a GIF. It is a Flourish story that has been set uh, on autoplay and uh, designed to loop on load, um, which is amazing. And we're currently uh, just replacing screen recordings and GIFs uh, whenever we create presentations, just because this is so much higher quality and it's just so much uh, easier and less time consuming. We have been on a roll <laughs> these last couple of months. We've been launching uh, so many new templates, uh, which are not necessarily um, all about uh, data and numerical data, uh, but also about uh, text and visualizing um, content overall uh, in a very cool and interactive way, which are the text annotator and timeline template. Um, my personal favorite. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, our uh, Data Explorer template, which is one of the most powerful um, Flourish templates ever. Um, and I actually shared a blog post uh, uh, that Mafia wrote recently about uh, the announcement of this template. So feel free to take a look at that. Yeah, well, thank you everybody um, who joined today for this session. I think Simona mentioned, but if not, I'll just repeat it. Um, our next webinar is going to be on October 11th, and we're going to be discussing how to visualize elections and elections results again and before the US midterm elections and also other electoral cycles like Brazil and yes, other events around the world. So 
feel free to join if you're interested in that. I feel like people maybe in newsrooms might be quite keen to learn more about that. So um, we'll be looking forward to see you there. Um,